Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. So I think we can start. Um, hi, my name is Ciprian Padurario. I'm one of the co-organizers from Ulm, and I'll chair the first session. So uh, the first talk will be from Carles Altimiras from SACLE, and uh, it's about the experimental test of the Kubo relation in a nonlinear conductor driven out of equilibrium. So please, Carles. Okay, so I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work. Um, so this work has been carried in, in, in SACLE, in, um, in the collaboration among the nanoelectronics and quantronics group, and uh, all the measurements that I will present were performed by Zuber uh, Iftikar and Jonas Müller. So the story I would like to talk to you about today is about fluctuations and dissipations, and this is a long story in electrical circuits, because uh, we know from the Nyquist uh, formulation of Johnson noise that you can uh, essentially describe the fluctuations of a dissipative system by uh, considering that a resistor is just uh, a, a transmission line carrying the information to infinity, losing it. We know from the 50s also that the zero point fluctuations of quantum systems give a noise floor providing an asymmetry between uh, positive and negative frequencies of the spectrum density of fluctuations. And this uh, was uh, understood by Kubo. This uh, noise asymmetry is generically linked to the linear response of your system to an exter external uh, uh, linear coupling. So all these ideas were um, uh, somehow put together by the caldera legate uh, description of dissipation in viscous uh, dissipation, that it's indeed this coupling to bosonic bath, and with that, well, there are many phenomena that can be predicted in elastic tunneling, dissipative quantum phase transitions resulting from this coupling, and so on. So I would like to stress that even though people use a cubo formula by uh, um, computing these uh, current fluctuations in a perturbative way, this structure um, holds far from equilibrium. So this was already a knowledge in the 80s, where rather than doing a, 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 a perturbative response, they were using a variational uh, computation of the perturbation. And the idea is that the linear response is still described by this structure, the, the asymmetric part of the fluctuation spectrum, but this fluctuation spectrum must be computed in the very out of equilibrium situation you might uh, end up. And this was uh, generalized uh, 10 years ago to, to arbitrary time dependent states in the sense that you have an arbitrary time dependent classical drive. So why is that uh, general, this structure? Well, if, if you look to, to a quantum system classically driven by a parametric drive, which is coupled to just uh, linearly coupled to one observable of the system, just a, a simple calculation of the power dissipated into the system tells you that indeed the, the power dissipated in the system is provided by the real part of the admittance as computed by the cubo formula. So it is just the Joule law effect. Of course, when your system A is driven by a quantum agent, well, you cannot uh, conclude things that easily, so you need to simplify your coupling to, to understand what's going on. Usually, um, we can take a, a, a simple system, just a quantum conductor coupled to a resonant mode with his own losses, and when you do some approximations that the, the energy stored into the resonator has no memory, so it's leaking faster than it is injected, which in practice it corresponds to a large impedance mismatch between the current conductor and its electromagnetic environment, you find that the power which is being dissipated by the quantum conductor takes this very simple form, which is a difference between a, a negative frequency current fluctuations weighted um, by one prefactor and uh, um, with an opposite side, the positive frequency current fluctuations. So with this convention, we find that there are indeed three terms. One term which doesn't care about the state of your electromagnetic environment, and this is just the spontaneous emission of the elect um, quantum conductor into its electromagnetic environment. As you put some energy into the environment, um, for example, with your input port, you get some stimulated emission from your conductor. But now, since there is some energy to take, the quantum conductor can take it 
and this is the stimulated absorption. So we find the same uh, things as in quantum uh, um, optics. So coming back to Kubo formula, you can of course rearrange these terms and to uh, just uh, express things proportional to the energy which is stored in the environment. And when you look at that, you see that indeed the rate at which you dissipate this energy into the conductor is given by these asymmetric uh, current fluctuations, which is just uh, the real part of the admittance by Kubo formula. Okay, so can we measure separately these fluctuations? Can we measure these elements? Well, historically people were looking at what you can do into the fields propagating into the light. So if you take the classical Johnson setup, which is you have some fluctuating field, you narrow bus filter it, and you look at how much power you get into this band by some uh, rectifier, it can be a diode, it can be a, a, a light bulb, and if you do the quantum theory of it, as in input-output theory, you get that the rectified signal is indeed the symmetric uh, combination of, uh, of the, the voltage fluctuations carried by the transmission line. So indeed, this is an observable, so the observable must be a, a real valued object, so it, is this, it has always this shape. I think that's why many people have believed for many times that one can only measure symmetrized noise. But then, uh, in 2000, it was realized that if rather than using a classical diode, you use something like uh, a quantum diode, so for example, a nonlinear tunneling device, then you can imprint the, the spectrum of fluctuations of the current conductor into the IV properties of the tunnel device. It's just uh, so it works with a, any nonlinear uh, um, tunneling element. It, um, it can be SIS, tunnel junctions, quantum dots, double quantum dots. So the idea is that you have a sort of current fluctuations, which thanks to some coupling circuit, imposes some uh, fluctuations of flux at the input of the nonlinear tunneling device. And to give you an idea, this is taken from uh, um, the group in Orsay. So um, how an SIS junction works uh, as a photon-assisted transport detector is it explains the fact that its energy spectrum is bounded by below, so you have a full range of operation where the device is only sensitive to the absorption of photons, and this absorption of photons gives rise to a rectification of the cur IV curve, which is only proportional to the emission noise which is sent to the device. When the bias um, is larger than twice the gap, the, the device is sensitive to both, so the photon-assisted uh, transport will be a combination of the, the emission noise and absorption noise which is imposed at its input. Still, one can use uh, one part of the, of the photon-assisted transport current to characterize just the emission noise of the conductor and hope to be able to um, subtract it from the, the part when you have both emission and absorption. This gives a well-defined uh, scheme to measure separately the emission and the absorption noise, and indeed, it was used uh, in 2010 to to measure different, um, separately the emission and the absorption noise of the thermal noise of a single mode uh, resonator. So the single mode resonator um, had uh, its temperature being uh, um, changed, and as the temperature is changed, one could see the, the two parts of the callon welton no noise, um, and the, the difference between the absorption and the emission noise was indeed checked to match the real part of the impedance of the, um, of the um, uh, source of, uh, of, of uh, thermal noise. The problem with this scheme is that it has never been possible to extract uh, um, the absorption noise of an active conductor. And the reason for that is that essentially the schemes that were used were completely symmetric. So if you want to measure the absorption noise of your source, your detector must be polarized in a regime where he's also sending some emission noise into the conductor. And if your um, coupling circuit is symmetric, you will have photon assisted transport from source to the detector, but you will have also photon assisted transport from your detector to your source. So this becomes uh, uh, strongly nonlinear, and they, and they did not manage to get quantitatively the absorption noise of the, of the source, because essentially both devices became a source. So, I would like to come back to the, to the power spectral density setup, and I would like to insist in something, is that indeed when you do a local measurement of your field um, with a quadratic detector, of course it's the symmetrized voltage fluctuations, 
but when you just play with the algebra, you see it's just the occupation plus the zero point motion of the detection line. So whatever you're doing at its input, the zero point notion of the line is just the zero point notion of the line. The question is, how is the power transferred um, by this line depending of its um, 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 input conditions? So this is what we were seeing before in this uh, um, treaty coupling between the quantum conductor and the electromagnetic uh, uh, environment. And the idea is very simple. When there is a strong uh, impedance mismatch between the quantum conductor and uh, the electromagnetic environment, the quantum conductor is imposing its current into the detection scheme, and then the power that you detect at the output is just the, the weighted sum of the current fluctuations of the of the quantum conductor weighted by uh, the voltage fluctuations of the electromagnetic environment. So when the electromagnetic environment is sitting um, with zero population close to vacuum, when you measure the emission noise into the, the, the differential noise, how much power is the quantum conductor depositing into the quadratic detector when you turn it on, then it will be directly proportional to the emission noise only of the quantum conductor. But now if you do this very same measurement with some population into the electromagnetic environment, you will have some contribution of the emission, some contribution on, on the absorption. And if you have calibrated this population, you can extract the emission contribution to deduce the absorption contribution. So this is again a, a, a well-defined scheme to, to access both. Okay. So um, here is the ex experimental implementation of this idea. We chose uh, an SIS tunnel junction as a quantum conductor. It's seeing a, a, a circuit via a bias T. The bias T enables us to voltage bias the SIS junction. And the capacitive port of this uh, bias T is sending the electromagnetic radiation to the radio frequency part of the circuit. So the SIS junction only sees uh, the environment via cavity filter sitting at 6.8 gigahertz. This is roughly 10 times uh, um, the excitation quanta um, at 6 gigahertz. It's roughly 10 times the, the, the thermal energy. So uh, we, are, we are sitting very close to vacuum. Then uh, the sample is protected from the detection line by a double circulation. It's amplified, routed to room temperature, where you, we just perform a, a, a power measurement with the diode. Uh, this is very standard. The main difference with uh, other setups is that the circulator sitting closer to the junction uh, has a 50 ohm match uh, um, normal tunnel junction, which is itself a voltage biased uh, uh, via this inductive port. So the idea is that this junction can also dissipate uh, the, the noise power coming back from the, from the amplifier, but at the same time, it can be used in order to impose some uh, um, population into the modes hitting the SIS junction via the cavity filter. So this is our experimental knob to control the number uh, um, of uh, photons which are seen by the, by the uh, SIS tunnel junction. Uh, okay, so this is the DC characterization of the, of the tunnel junction. So we just uh, voltage bias it and we measure um, its current. So um, indeed it behaves like an SIS tunnel junction. I would like to stress it's uh, been designed in a squid geometry so that we can uh, cancel the Josephson contribution. Also for specialists, we needed to apply some uh, not negligible magnetic field in order to avoid the backbending of the structure. So this is why uh, the, the coherence peaks are uh, somehow uh, broadened. Uh, but still it's quite sharply defined. We see that there is a DC transport gap of roughly 400 microelectron volts, which is indeed uh, quite a standard value for thin film aluminum uh, junctions. So this is roughly 50 nanometers and 30 nanometers uh, thickness. And the important thing is that the DC transport gap that we get from this DC characterization is roughly 400 microelectron volts. So this is the DC characteristic. Let's look at the power, the SIS junction is depositing into the detection circuit when we apply a voltage on it. So this is what we measure. We just make the difference between the power which is present into the line without applying a bias into the junction and the power 
that we measure when we have um, applied the bias into the junction. So it looks very similar to the IV characteristic of the SIS junction. This is expected from um, the microscopic calculations of its uh, um, um, current fluctuations. The very important thing is that you see now that the onset of power emission is slightly different than the one we had for DC transport. Before it was 400 microelectron volts, now it's slightly up, and if we look closely, this is exactly the quantum of excitation of the photon into the detection line. And now if we take uh, the, the microscopic calculations of the current fluctuations, um, which are non-symmetrized, the emission noise, we indeed see that it uh, fits very uh, neatly. And uh, the microscopic picture is that, is that in order to be able to emit a photon into the environment, the quasiparticles need to have enough uh, energy in order to do so. So of course, you will get the same uh, rate of emission as you had as the rate of the uh, current going through the device, but with an offset of exactly one quantum of uh, excitation. So from this measure, when we can check indeed from that uh, the power emitted in vacuum is proportional to the emission noise of the, of the current fluctuations of the conductor. Now we will uh, use the, the NIN junction in order to tune the population of the, of the electromagnetic environment. For that, we just, uh, I mean, this is just uh, um, power emitted by the short noise of the junction. When this is the, the, the differential power that we detect uh, Again, at room temperature, um, it's the difference between the power emitted by the amplifier and the, the power emitted by the junction. So it fits, uh, well, this is the, the curve we have. Um, uh, this is the, no the expected uh, um, um, short noise emitted by, a, by a, a normal state tunnel junction from which we can get um, well, an interesting property, the, temper the electronic temperature of the electrons, so it's roughly 30 millik. And the idea now is to look into how the SIS junction is exchanging energy with the environment when the environment has been uh, tuned to these different uh, um, population points. So when we do that, these are the, the traces we obtain. So this is the power when both uh, um, sources are active, uh, and when we subtract uh, the, the power, um, the, the, the noise uh, power of the, of the chain. So we recover the, the curve we saw before. When we do nothing, it's just the emission noise. And as we increase uh, the, the, the power emitted by the normal junction, in this there is a background uh, power which is detected. And when we get closer to the superconducting gap, um, uh, when we apply the voltage in the SAS junction, we see that we are taking some power out of it and the amount of power we take, it's um, larger and larger. Um, it seems proportional to the available power to take from. So in order to make this more quantitatively, what we do is to subtract the power which is just present in the, in the resonator. So this is the, the, the trace which describes the power exchanges between the SIS junction and its electromagnetic environment at finite population. So we, at zero bias, this is just the emission noise curve. And now that we see that uh, uh, for all the curves, uh, the, the onset of, uh, of uh, absorption from the SIS junction starts at twice the gap minus the excitation quanta. Okay. All this negative power contribution is just on dissipation from the junction, um, uh, in the junction, uh, taking power from the environment. And this part is what globally there is a net emission into the environment. So if we take all these curves, uh, we can scale them into a single curve by using uh, the formula I was presenting you before. So we, can, we should be able to describe uh, these um, power exchanges with just uh, um, uh, these three quantities. So in order to absorb the, to extract the, the absorption noise of the quantum conductor, what we do is to take the data measured of the exchange power at finite population. We need to subtract the emission noise. This is just the exchange power measured at zero population. We need to weight it by this factor. This is just one plus the population that we can calibrate independently. And finally, divide by n. If we do that, all the traces uh, fall into the same uh, curve. Of course, when there is less signal, uh, there is more noise. 
but they are sitting all in the same shape. And I have to say that in order to get this uh, uh, beautiful agreement between uh, what we expect from microscopic calculations and our calibrations of the occupation number, we need to, to correct it by one dB, which is roughly 20%. Um, so this is the trace we expect for the absorption, eye, and, and it's the same uh, microscopic picture as we had for the emission, is that indeed uh, when uh, um, the, 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 the bias is such that we are lying just beneath the, the transport gap by the amount of one photon, we can absorb this energy and dissipate it into the SIS uh, junction. So we, so I hope that I convince you at this point that the, from just power exchanges between uh, the, the quantum conductor and its electromagnetic environment, the fact that the electromagnetic environment is sitting so close to vacuum, it has enough asymmetry in its own uh, um, voltage fluctuations to um, be able to extract something which is indeed uh, asymmetric as well for the quantum conductor. But the point of having such a circuit is that it's, it can be multiple purpose and uh, we can do some other measurements that just incoherent uh, and power exchanges. So in between uh, the double circulator and the quantum conductor, we have a, a 20 dB coupler, which is used to send uh, a coherent tone, uh, which is uh, provided by a network analyzer. The, um, this is a monochromatic excitation with a well-defined phase. And then we can analyze from the reflection uh, um, measurement what is the linear response of the SAS junction. This is a, a, the standard measurement of linear response. So of course you need to tune uh, the, the excitation uh, uh, amplitude uh, to a small enough value to have indeed a linear response. But with that we can measure independently the admittance of the conductor by a coherent uh, linear response measurement. When we do that, we obtain uh, this uh, uh, um, red line, which uh, looks like the DC conductance of the quantum conduct of the SAS junction, but with rather than have a sharp uh, um, coherence peak, it, there is a sort of plateau. And uh, if we understand the real part of the admittance as a function of the Cubo formula, indeed, uh, we expect uh, to have this shape because we need to make the difference between these two curves. This, this difference becomes essentially constant uh, at large enough voltage. This is just the normal state admittance and close to the coherence peak, it will uh, be larger. So this is what we directly measure from the VNA and the black curve is the one we construct using a cubo relation from the emission and the absorption noise we have measured before. So these are two completely different measurements. One is incoherent power exchanges between the conductor and its environment and the red curve is a linear response coherent uh, measurement. And we see that at the end the agreement is 10%, uh, roughly 0.5 dB, so it's even of the order of the, of, the, of the calibration accuracy that we have in the lab. Okay, so uh, at this point I would like to, to come back to the, um, to the um, generality of this uh, cubo relation. I mean, it, since it's so much related to the dissipation, it must be better than just uh, lowest order perturbation. If, if we take uh, the, the, the simple system of the quantum conductor, which is uh, minimally coupled to an electromagnetic conductor via radiative coupling, I fire, well, you can extract these formulas to, from the lowest order perturbation theory. This is uh, what essentially is done in, in the no memory um, calculation, it uh, it's justifies that you can take these, uh, these lowest order perturbation theory. Also the impedance mismatch is justifying that you can use it. But you see that um, the current fluctuations that you get describing these, uh, these energy exchanges are the ones you have in the absence of the coupling, so it's not at all general. Because we know that we're missing lots of physics. When this coupling is big enough, either because current fluctuations or because of the, the, the flux fluctuations are big, we will have lots of things. When the flux fluctuations are big, we will have detection back action. When the current fluctuations are big enough, we will have memory effects building in the system. 
we can have because of this frequency curvature between uh, the, the frequencies that we are sending and the ones we are probing. So this is never captured by such uh, uh, a lowest order perturbation. But the thing is that the electromagnetic environment is a linear uh, system. That means that the flux operator describing the dynamics of the electromagnetic operator can be split into essentially its continuum and we can specialize a detection uh, uh, frequency band. And of course, the uh, the, its own Hamiltonian can also be split as a sum over the continuum and a very narrow band uh, detection circuit. So if we restrain uh, the power exchanges to a very narrow band of observation of, of, of these power exchanges, we will end up with a, a, a vanishing measure um, uh, flux fluctuations arising from the, from the environment at which we are looking at the energy exchanges. And still, uh, the rest of the system gets decoupled. And this is essentially the dress conductor by all the dynamics which are present in the system besides this. So unless we have a very, uh, I would say, singular electromagnetic environment, of course, if you have a singular electromagnetic environment, you will now look at the system as an open dissipative system. It will be a closed system, and then you will do other sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, you will describe the physics differently. But if it's an open quantum system with no singularity um, response in the environment, this is licit. And then you can still use uh, um, the same uh, approach, but with just the coupling to this narrow band uh, part. So the, the message here is that not all the power exchanges are given by this effect. But if you look at the power spectral density in a narrow band enough uh, system, you can still define the energy exchanges in this narrow band as the weighted sum of the uh, emission noise and absorption noise of the dressed system weighted by the um, absorption noise and emission noise of the, of, the, of the voltage fluctuations of the electromagnetic environment. So we still have uh, th this uh, result that the, the Cubo formula is indeed describing the, the dissipation even in this strongly dressed uh, um, conductor by the dynamics of its uh, um, coupling to the environment. Okay, so uh, I am finished. I, I would uh, uh, like to sum up. So uh, f first thing I showed is that the, the non-symmetrized emission and absorption noise of a quantum conductor can be extracted simply from the power exchanges with a linear electromagnetic environment whose population can be um, calibrated. Then we could compare the Cubo formula uh, we could test the Cubo formula by comparing the, the, the asymmetric part of these uh, uh, current fluctuations to the linear response which was measured independently by a coherent tone. And finally, I, I stress that the, 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 these uh, power exchanges are linked to linear response um, as soon as the detection bandwidth uh, is sufficiently small and there is a strong impedance mismatch between the quantum conductor and its electromagnetic environment which physically is just the conductor imposing its current to the detection and the detection imposing its voltage to the conductor. I would like to stress that uh, this will stop working beyond this current source limit. As soon as the detection impedance is of the same order as the impedance of the quantum conductor, one cannot make this um, easy separation between uh, current fluctuations injected and voltage fluctuations imposed. At this point, you need a self-consistency because essentially this is telling you that the, uh, you cannot uh, consider voltage fluctuations as arising from the electromagnetic environment alone. Uh, and then, of course, if both are uh, larger than uh, the, the quantum uh, of resistance, you will have heavy non-Gaussian effects if the system is driven out of equilibrium. Um, that's complicated. Also, um, I would like to stress that um, this simple formula, as I said, is only narrow band. But if you think of frequency conversion in the system, for example, if you have some sort of uh, um, inelastic scattering at a given number of modes only. If you look locally at what happens to your conductor, if you're sitting into the middle band, some power will be um, transferred to the um, other modes. 
But if you integrate the power which is being carried by all these modes, you expect to have all of it originally. So I would expect to have some, some rules that hold on for the nonlinear conversion that arises from the higher order um, uh, perturbation. I think I've never seen uh, anything stated uh, about if there are some possible sum rules. I think this is interesting in, in the, in the uh, I would say, uh, super nonlinear dissipation you have in uh, close to, to quantum phase transitions where you have huge cascades of energy transfer, yet the Josephson junction cannot dissipate anything. It's just shared amongst all other photons. So I guess that if you look at a wide band um, energy transfer, you should just recover all the power you were sending. That means that you will have some, some rules on um, describing the nonlinear conversion. So, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Um, uh, of course, I would like to thank all our collaborators, and I would like to thank a lot Fabien, who passed away two years, but from whom I learned everything I know what to do. So, thank you very much, and if you have any questions, do not hesitate. Thank you very much, Carles, uh, for this beautiful experiment. Uh, please, questions. Hey, very interesting results. Thanks for the talk. I have a few questions. Uh, one is about the Cooper pairs, like tunneling through inelastically. Uh, do you see a sign of that? Like, sure, sure. I think if we do not, uh, if we do not uh, frustrate the squid, uh, there are lots of them, and they are very strong, and it's a mess. You see all the imperfections of the sample. We did not design a sample in order to look at that. Essentially, you see all the ripples of the line. It's, it's a mess. It's not made for that. If you want to do that properly, you engineer your electromagnetic environment on chip. This is what, it's not what we did here. You see the, the cavity filter is outside. There is some cable length between the cavity filter and the conductor. You will have lots of standing modes there, roughly at, uh, I think it's 20 centimeters cable. So it will be in the 100 megahertz regime. They will be thermal populated. It's lots of structure, yes. Right, okay. Um, and in your slide 19, like at low, at low voltages, at like, do you, you, in principle, you should see the Cooper pairs putting, putting photons to the, your, your own chip cavity filter, but. Uh, here you see, we did not exactly manage to, to frustrate it completely. You see a tiny peak. These are the Cooper pairs. Right. Yes, that's, that's what I was yeah. thinking. But what, what do you, so, sorry, I didn't know, what do you kind of mean by the frustration? The because squid, if you apply a magnetic field onto the squid, you will uh, frustrate the Josephson current going through that. Right, and, okay. Uh, and of course, um, this is what we saw yesterday, the power you meet has the, the, the fluctuation strength of the source, and uh, the fluctuation strength of the source is parametrically changed by the frustration. Okay, great, got it, got it. Um, then I have one question about the, uh, like you said that in the NIN case, you can actually map out the temperature of the electrons, but sure. then in your SIS case, can you map out the quasi-particle temperature or something similar? Um, the gap is so big that there is no thermal effect. So you don't see... The, no, 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 the, the zero temperature. I mean, of course, here there is some broadening, but like, again, this comes from the magnetic field, uh, which is uh, killing the sharpness of the uh, coherence peaks. So th there's n that's not a temperature effect. Yeah, I'm kind of just wondering what, what is the effective temperature of your... Quasi-particle bath? Of, uh, let's say that, no, I mean, you have to, like, now you have an electromagnetic environment that is the photon acid and tunneling. Yeah. So what is the effective temperature of your, of that electromagnetic environment? Ah. That's my question. How close uh, to zero is that? <laughs> okay, I mean, temperature, you, I mean, in, these are just uh, electromagnetic power exchanges. So if you take the engineering conversion, whatever signal has a noise temperature. But this is not a physical temperature. This is, this is just an easy way of describing uh, power. But uh, having a finite temperature means not only the power, its fluctuations, all of this. So we do not have a thermal source. We have a short noise source. This short noise source, in this limit, it's low impedance. It's very, very close to a, to a chaotic source. These are the calculations from, uh, I remember, for example, 
but I mean, this, uh, this is the shunt noise emitted at high frequency and by the normal tunnel junction. And if the impedance is small, they will be essentially very, very close to a Gaussian. Uh, uh, it's chaotic. But the, 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 the power um, um, gives you some number. From this number, you can express its own fluctuations. It looks like a, a, a black body source. But there is no reason, I mean, if you change the source, you would still be able to describe a power with temperature, but this is just uh, playing with numbers. Um, it wouldn't be able to predict what's going on at other correlation functions of the power. But here we just couple to the lowest order. This is the point of having this impedance mismatch. So we do not even care about the actual state of the environment as soon as it is not singular. Nico. Yeah. Thanks. Very nice talk. Uh, I would have a question about the perspective. Yes. Uh, could you think about, I guess, it's obvious, but uh, how easy maybe is it to replace the SIS junction by a more exotic conductor? And is there any, because you have somehow a narrow band uh, well, detection scheme, as you said. What can it's you learn? narrow band with respect to the nonlinearity present into yeah. the system. If yeah. you have something as nonlinear as the one you play with, huh? yeah. I, uh, 600 megahertz, I think, would be too wide. Yes. So my question is, how easy would it be to swap your SIS junction by? I don't this know, is uh, easy, but then and, and can I you mean, learn something interesting? No, this the is problem. Maybe my question. Yes, I mean, I've I've always, I mean, there are these. Um, predictions from uh, Ash Clark's group where, if, I mean, that would be the sort of dynamical Coulomb blockade uh, when you change Gaussian fluctuations by non-Gaussian fluctuations, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the idea, I guess, you have in mind. Yes, that's interesting. The thing is that uh, you are doomed to do that on chip if you want to be, if you do not, I mean, you have too much losses to be doing that. You will. So you will lose part of these nonlinear fluctuations and they will be wasted in the lines here. I mean, in the calibrations at the end, you always have insertion losses plus some return losses. You have all these ripples. It's difficult to be very quantitative. And more importantly, you will be losing the, the, the non-Gaussian oscillator strength. I would say the interesting experiment is doing it on chip. I mean, I think Perti did uh, some experiments uh, I mean, long time ago doing this idea, I think that with what I understand now, if I did them, I would go with a, a very asymmetric coupling scheme. I mean, here, the, the thing is that you want to impose the non-Gaussian current fluctuations into the detector. But you do not want the detector to, to have this effect. But then it's easy, you just use an impedance transformer. The impedance transformer will give rise to a big voltage here with a tiny current there, and it will be the opposite. So for the equal amount of power exchange, this is reciprocal in power, it is not reciprocal in the two uh, um, quadratures. So this is the way to go, I think. Uh, if you want to do that, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thanks a lot. I think Alvin. there is, uh, oh, maybe. Okay. Quick, quick. Quick. Yes, hi. In the last slide, you were saying that the, at the end, everything is going to be the same, no? But the, the modes are going to be dressed because of the coupling, no? And now you have to fix only in a narrow band. But yeah, I'm asking if, if the band uh, yes. you fix into the detection is narrow band okay. enough, you will have no perturbation from it into the dynamics. Okay, but let me ask, what do you mean by this dressing? Because I'm thinking in the A squared diamagnetic term, when you couple a qubit with an electromagnetic field, then what you have, it is not just a dressing. It is something that can change substantially the nature of your modes. So you may not yeah, have sure. even... Yeah, of course. So this is... Uh, the flux, the voltage fluctuations arising from that can have a lot of current content from the, from the source, of course. So it changes deeply the nature of it. It will become non-Gaussian already, of course. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the cos phi you have in the, in the spin boson or uh, in the uh, version in CQED. It's, it's strongly non-Gaussian. Okay, thank you. 
All right, okay. let's thank uh, Carles again.